But now it's time for our feature presentation. And this one has been six million years in the making, so to speak. We'll be looking at the merchandise and there is so much merchandise rather than trying to look at everything, we're just going to have a good look at each um, section of merchandise because if we went into everything, we would be here for multiple shows. Interestingly, a lot of it is very hard to find in Australia. It wasn't as merchandised here, even though it was shown here for years and years as it was in America. So the $6 million now, I don't know if you knew this, it was actually based on an existing series of books. Mm. Um, and he wasn't called the six million dollar man in that he was called cyborg i think with the with the show they wanted to call it cyborg but of course they didn't have the rights for it so they had to sort of like uh, okay would have caused all sorts of copyright issues so uh what yeah. they come up with the six million dollar man was infinitely more exciting than just cyborg yeah I, I agree it was a lot better and a lot catchier term the interesting thing of course when the six million dollar man was made all of these books were rebranded as mm. six million dollar man tie-in so they obviously made the creator a shit ton more money um you can see here after the six million dollar man came out they started doing cyborg the book that inspired the six billion uh, million dollar man and then slowly the artwork sort of went over to more the tv version so you can mm. see there's a series of paper book paperbacks there and the paperbacks all had original covers and all came out pre that, but they were sort of backwards branded to be Steve Austin in the red jumpsuit on the cover because they're obviously going to sell a lot more. Um, I find it interesting that with the Cyborg books, they've gone for the, I assume it's Steve Austin still, gone for the ripped shirt and the muscles and all the rest of it. But in uh, the Six Million Dollar Man books, he's just wearing the red jumpsuit and is very, very ordinary. So clearly for the Cyborg, they had to try and sell it on the sex appeal of the guy rather than just the character so that's an interesting sort of contrast and then again you can see um these are the same books and they get reprinted over and over to the point where they're just using stills from the movie as um pictures that are selling the books and the cyborg is almost totally dropped and you've got like the six million dollar man with the the cyborg in, in tiny little letters underneath and in some cases totally dropped altogether and some of the the earliest original merchandise is the code books and things like that that are on, under the bottom there the secret puzzle codes and train your android brain and bionic eye puzzles and things like that and you can see apart from the books when they originally started merchandising this show they really didn't know who the audience was and who was going to want this stuff. So the merchandising is absolutely all over the place. Now, in, we, we've looked at these before and we've looked at other franchises, particularly J J June has some crackers, but some of the very first stuff that was released was colouring books. And you can see that's got the original um, Bionic Man logo, which was that almost, you know, Star Wars mm. stretching up uh, type logo. And this was... 1973, 1974, so way before Star Wars. And again, you do wonder, these were sort of James Bond for television movies and they've got very um, kids' colouring books for them. And I love the one. I found that one that's been coloured in apparently by Stephanie where the <laughs> bionic man is drinking a martini and casually looking down the top of the girl that he's sitting next to, which I thought is a great topic for a colouring book. Well, maybe he's looking at the top thing and I would have coloured that a different colour. Um the Six Billion Dollar Man, the earlier stuff, again, I, I said is all over the place. So we've got the early publicity stuff there. And then one of the earliest things I could find was a Six Billion Dollar Man T-shirt transfer. And again, these were one of those things they could knock out relatively cheap. They just came on sheets of paper and you ironed them on. I don't know if anyone remembers doing that. But you've yep. got, again, a lot of activity uh, books for kids. So you've got the activity book and the amazing um, Six Million Dollar Man dot to dot book. I couldn't find any in internal pictures of that, but that would probably be quite groovy. You've got some publicity stills there. And the one I liked was him in the cockpit of the shuttle. And you've got the TV Week uh, cover. So when it came out, there was a TV Week cover. And it's from that time in the 70s where the picture's still a bit trippy. So you've got like his picture and then the hand and then all the bionics inside the hand, which is a uh, quite a cool image. So one of the first things that took off was um, Six Billion Dollar Man comics. Now, we've talked about comics in different franchises. We've had um, American comics and DC and Marvel and British comics with Countdown and TV21 and stuff like this. This is a different um, style of comics, again, where some of the comics um, that came out for different TV and movie franchises were almost 
more like magazines. So they were magazine size, but they had comics inside and some of them were colour and some of them were black and white. And other ones in that did this was the Hulk and they did it with Planet of the Apes, if anyone has any of those comics. The Six Billion Dollar Man did it as well. And this really surprised me because I've collected for years and years and I don't think these were released in Australia because I've never seen any of these turn up locally when I've been going through collections. And they're particularly good because what I love with um, the comics that this era, sometimes the paintings on the cover were obviously done by an artist that wasn't from the comic book sort of circle. And then the comics inside were done by um, the, the comic book artists. And that means it almost has a, a sort of appeal to a, of a more adult magazine to it. And the $6 million ones were ones like, man when ones like that where you have these amazing pictures of the exploits of steve austin which you would never see on tv i mean him throwing around tigers and and things like that although he did wrestle an alligator which is on one of the comics but it was a very dodgy one in the tv episode not a realistic one that you see in the comic book picture and here's some more of the comics. I couldn't find much original art, but there is some of it out there in collection. So there's a, a cover there and you can see the cover next to it after it's been inked and coloured. Now, the comics were um, sold all around the world and there was different adaptations. I do like El Hombre Nucular, which is obviously a Latin version of it where um, he's the nuclear man. And then um, there's other versions of the comics there. Some of them well, the bottom left, you can see they went back to very comic book looking amongst this run of amazing paintings. And the one I was talking about there is the, the second one from the left where he's fighting a crocodile or an alligator. You can see in other ones he's doing the bending the steel girders and jumping out of helicopters and all those kind of things that are easier to do in comic book media than they would be in the um, TV series. And, of course, you know you've made it when you start getting yeah. parodies of the um, actual TV series on different shows. And, and, of course, in the print media, they always had the mad and cracked magazines. So they got away with stuff I don't think, I don't know if they'd get away with now. I guess it's mad and cracked. But they had the $6 million man parody. But with the bionic woman, they changed it into the moronic woman. And I just think the way things are now, they probably couldn't do that. And you read some of the panels, and I won't read them, but basically the gist of it is a lot of it is like, oh, you've had $6 million put into you by the government. You have to be really careful. And they're like, what of the foreign spies? They're like, no, the American taxpayer, they're totally pissed with <laughs> that much money being wasted. So total mad, um, cracked sort of humour. And you can see it's a Christmas episode. And what are they giving each other? Batteries. Yeah. I love the batteries. And the fact that her says ever ready, you can probably interpret that a couple of different ways. But he's got the Duracell, and of course, you know, the intention being the Duracell will last longer. Um, yeah. So, yes, indeed, there's a bit of a subtext there, but uh, I thought that was actually kind of funny. And um, the last lot of comics and, and magazines adaption is we're looking more into magazines. I think the two coolest ones there. Uh, the Six Million Dollar Man on the Planet of the Apes. Now, I have not read that, and I don't know what happens in that, but I do want to track that down and find it out. And they also had the amazing Spider-Man crossover with the Bionic Man, which is one of those crossovers I didn't know happened. But the Bionic Man seems to be, like, throwing Spider-Man and getting the better of Spider-Man. Um, anyone who's watched the show, I do go on about the, the famous Monsters horror magazine and when they had the Sasquatch and Bigfoot um, Bionic, Bionic Man got a cover of Steve Austin and uh, the Bigfoot fighting it out. And then a lot of the other magazines from the time are um, sort of very iconic and have great covers of uh, Steve Austin. I love the idea of the uh, Steve Austin with the Planet of the Apes. I did not know about that one. That's a really bizarre sort of like um, uh, pairing. But, of course, he's an astronaut, so you can sort of do it and get away with it and make it work. Yeah. So, yeah. And then um, British magazine Look In was the sort of home of the Bionic Man in the UK. And for the entire time that the show was being run there, it was very popular and it got covers um every couple of issues and you can see you've got the Bionic Man and you've got the Bionic Woman that have covers and you get or also get Oscar on a couple of them and sometimes they share covers so it's the only time you're ever going to see mm. the Bionic Woman with the Tomorrow People and stuff like that and, and of course any show or any franchise that's popular in the 70s and 80s got sets of cards and the Bionic Man was no different so there were different sets of um, the Six Million Dollar Man cards they are quite rare and I have seen them locally and I've actually found them quite boring and I think the reason I find them boring is the colours they used at the border of the cards make them all look washed out 
Mm. And they never really had a lot of action scenes in them. There was a lot of headshots and things like that. And when you're getting the, the set of cards, it's good to get the headshots of the characters once, but then you want to see him fighting Bigfoot and jumping out of windows and in space and stuff like that. And for me, it seemed like they really missed an opportunity on doing an amazing set of cards. When you want some chow and have some lunch, you've got to take your uh, $6 million man lunchbox with you. And this is incredible because they've branded it $6 million man. So what's Lee Marvin doing busting through that tin down in the bottom centre there? Or, or it's, it's very weird how they sometimes got Lee Major spot on and sometimes it looks absolutely nothing like him. And yeah. I do wonder if that was to do with when the original ones came out, he wasn't a household name. So they just thought they could whack any strong looking man on. And then after that, when he became successful, they changed it. But I think these lunch boxes are particularly cool because um, you can see when they've depicted stuff, especially on the sides of them, they've taken amazing scenes from different movies so you have got what they should have put in the cards where he's fighting bigfoot and wrestling with sharks and mm. um underwater and then he's throwing massive boulders that are bigger than him or he's fighting with um maskatron and then you've got the bionic woman who's teaching at school which i think is really hilarious because you've got the six million dollar man who's like like almost running someone through with a tree in the top one and then fighting people. And then you've got Jamie Summers, who's like teaching in front of a blackboard with a American flag behind her. So it really just, just so the different mindset that they had between what little girls wanted and what little boys wanted back then. The other thing um, I found interesting was the Bionic Man records because um, apart from the soundtrack and you've got the soundtrack album, most of them were the comic book records where you, um, you follow a story along with the pictures and most of them had four stories on the 145, which must have made for really short stories to squeeze that much on. But he used to be a tradition at Christmas and there's like three Bionic Man Christmas records. So someone in the, um, in the recording industry decided we're going to make this a tradition and pump out a Bionic Man Christmas record every year for kids to put under the, the Christmas tree. Um, and I've never seen them. I've seen maybe the soundtrack one with the picture from the TV series locally, but uh, the other ones are quite hard to get. There was a lot of $6 million man um, records, so it's probably quite hard to get a, a good mint set of those. Yeah, and I thought these were particularly good kits as well because often when they make kits from a show or something, they're not very well thought out. But I thought each one of these was actually really good because it fits in with the character and it also is dynamic, dynamic and uh, an amazing little scene all on their, their own. So you've got, of course, the the motorbike where, of course, the comic, uh, the model company has taken an existing bike and added the $6 million man, but all the other ones are unique. So you've got him, like, throwing a gorilla. And I don't know if that's from an episode. Probably not. The 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 one where he's kicking down at a door is for an em from an episode. I remember that. He would run down a cor corridor and then in slow motion jump up and punch a door down. Uh, the genius thing about that is the door is crumbling, but Steve Austin is held in midair by the way the model is put together. You've got the traditional wrestling, the alligator, which was, again, from an episode, but I think it was in the water when he did it. And the other one which I hadn't seen was the bionic repair station, and you've got um, Jamie Summers there with one of her legs partially removed and all the spare parts and someone working on her, and that's just a really nice little model kit you could put together and have on your shelf. So once again, Steve is in all the action scenes and Jamie's <laughs> in a repair shop. And then we've got, um, we move over to Jigsaws, and Jigsaws were always a big thing with um, popular franchises that did well. And there were a lot of Jigsaws, and I've just put some of the highlights. There's the poster for some of the Jigsaws there on the left, and then there's the Whitman's British Jigsaws down the middle. There's four different ones, but I only put three up because they were kind of very similar. And again, they're not the same artwork, but they're the same kind of scenes, what we saw on the lunchbox, where... In this one, it doesn't look like he's wrestling a shark. It's, it looks like he's swum up to the shark and he's just tapping on the side of it to see if anyone's at home. Um, and I don't know if you'd remember these jigsaws. Do you remember the ones that used to come in tins? Yeah. Um, there was all different franchises, but um, I did have a $6 million one at one stage. That was one of the few pieces of merchandise I do remember seeing in Australia. And you could get a lot of different jigsaws in tins 
at the time. It was kind of a gimmick. You don't really see that now. And then there's an American one, again, where he's sort of fighting with Bigfoot, and that was a, a very cool one that I had never seen. So if you were into your puzzles, you were quite well served with the Bionic Man franchise. Yeah, so there's a few different games. Um, we did an episode on board games and we looked at some of these. And since then, I found a new version, the Di Diagnostic Bionic, which is Bionic Crisis, but it's the French version. I think the French version is actually is actually a nicer cover than the standard version because it's got more colour to it. These games are good because um, we've talked about it before. Usually with a franchise, they just whack the, you know, the Flintstones on Snakes and Ladders and call it a Flintstones game. But the Bionic... Uh, men games actually were um, all show sort of related. So one of them, you get different missions and then you play around the build of uh, the game to try and um, complete the missions that are from the show and like, like in the show doing different things and using different abilities. And then the Bionic Crisis one is basically almost like trying to complete circuits to get um, mm. energy through to the Bionic Man and it's a different game again. So they actually were quite good games that were relevant to the show. Going on to what was probably the most successful thing that was associated with the Bionic Man, and that was Kenner's toy promotion that did go for years and was very successful for a boy's toy um, that was action figures because up until that point, the main action figures were Action Man and G.I. Joe at that sort of 12-inch scale. Star Wars figures had not come along and there weren't many figures at all that were that scale, so most of the figures were Barbie scale. And... Toy companies tried over and over to get a franchise that boys would jump on board with and collect. G.I. Joe was the most popular because it was military, but there weren't many other ones. So Steve Austin really did break the mould for Kenner. But you can see how well they tied in the Bionic Man to what kids were doing. They had comic book pages and adverts that actually were unique comics talking to the kids about why you should get them and what the different accessories do. And I think this is great because... Before there's the internet and TV and all that kind of thing, you'd see the Bionic Command Center and you go, what the hell is that? It looks like a, a big tube or something. But then when you read your favorite comic and you've got Steve Austin going, well, this is my diagnostics table and you put the doll in this and it can attach to this and then you can put it all together and turn it into a rocket and blast off. Suddenly that toy has a lot more playability because of the imagery you've put in a kid's head through the comic book that you're reading. So that's quite ingenious where you've got a franchise that uses different media to sell different products to the same sort of age group and the same target audience. And Bionic Man was probably one of the earliest ones to do that very well. So they did Oscar and they gave him an accessory you couldn't probably do now. He had a exploding bomb suitcase what every terrorist needs. Um, so you got this accessory with him just to make him, I guess, a bit more exciting than the dude that sits at his desk. And they did do his desk and the operation centre um, in this series. But it was one of those things where they did sell the Bionic Man over and over. And what they would do, they would update it. So um, they changed the G.I. Joe Kung Fu grip to his Bionic grip. And then he could do different things and different um, versions of the figure would do different things um, with the accessories they had. So that's right. One of the most famous things that they did for this yeah. was they put a telescopic lens in the back of his head so kids could look through it and have Bionic vision. And they did the same thing with the uh, Boba Fett figure. Um, mm. So they obviously recycled a lot of the stuff they did with the Bionic, Bionic Man. I think it's interesting too that with the Steve character, they just do him the red jumpsuit. They didn't think of putting him in anything else. They didn't even cross their minds to do that, I think. When I th oh, that's probably a lost opportunity. Collect them all, six different variants of exactly the same figure but different clothing. They, uh, well, they, yeah. they, they did add um, different clothes you could buy separately but all of the bionic men that came as the figure just came in the standard red jumpsuit some of them came with a flight yeah. helmet as well now i think we're sort of heading into what is very some very limited bionic woman stuff is that right yeah well i was showing kind of here how the bionic woman and the bionic man they did very similar things and as we were saying earlier um exactly the same toy very different thing for uh guys and girls so you had the six million dollar man mission center and it's um, Jamie Summers' sort of fashion pad. So you had the same toy and they just rebranded it and um, used it as different things. And at the top there, you can see it's got like extra legs and you could buy extra arms for different missions. 
some of the dolls or some of the figures had it so you could pop the arms off and some of them didn't. Now, this can be an issue if you have one of the ones that has the bionic grip and the arms don't pop up because of the um, mechanism inside and then you get one of your relatives for your birthday gives you a set of extra arms and legs that are much cooler than the ones that go with it. So you go, how do these things come off? Crunch, crunch, and you've just busted your toy and you can't fit the new legs on it at all. But don't so worry, dude. You have the technology to rebuild him. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so these are two of the villains that actually made it into um, toy form. Bigfoot's interesting. He wasn't a real Bigfoot. He was a bionic Bigfoot made by mm. aliens. Um, so there you go. It just ticks all the boxes, doesn't it? But the Venus probe was one of the last toys that was released for the $6 million man line. And it is consequently one of the rarest um, toys, not just in the $6 million line, but from the 70s for people to get. So they used to go for a couple of thousand. Now they're pushing more than 5,000 to get a boxed Venus probe. So if you're collecting um, the $6 million man, you almost need to take out a loan to get that last one. The Bigfoot is an interesting one. It always turns up broken. It has a well, it has panels on it that expose its bionics in the chest. And basically, by flicking it open, you almost can instantly break it as well. And now they're old toys and they've gone brittle. Best not to play with them at all. So we could have done a whole show just on the stuff that Kenner released. There's a few interesting ones there. If you look at the CB headset, that was an actual radio that they brought out that's very cool. It looked like Steve Austin's um, radio when he's in jets and stuff like that. That was actually repurposed as one of the very first Star Wars toys. So Luke Skywalker's headset on the Millennium Falcon, and it was just luck that they had something that looked like it. So everyone knows Star Wars was very, um, the toys were caught with their pants down and didn't get it out very fast. But that one they could because they already had the toy. Down the bottom, you can see the opportunity they missed with Steve Austin. They didn't miss with Jamie Summers, where they mm -hmm. released all the different costumes they could for little girls to um, collect and play with. And it was a particularly long and successful line. So you can see there was different versions. You can see there's the space suit up the top corner there. And then there were different versions of clothes you could buy for Steve as well. You can see on the top there is the OSI headquarters. Um, and that was where, yep, yeah, if you wanted to buy, get a, a boring place play set for Oscar to sit down and look at world maps, they actually released that too. So they really did do an extensive range. And for a 12-inch boys toy, there aren't a lot of toys that release this much stuff. All right, well, we're going to leave you to it. As always, uh, leave your $6 million. Well, you could almost call it the $60 million man now because he's uh, be worth that much. Uh, collectibles mint in their boxes. Or rip it off the card with a na 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 na. <laughs> <laughs>